Taylor Hartley, Fall 2000. So going to the BYU Jerusalem Center was a treasure. I mean, a wonderful spiritual experience overall and neat experience in so many ways. And the first time that I became interested in the BYU Jerusalem Center was actually 11 years ago. Uh, well, 11 years um, when I was 11 years old is what I mean. So at that time I was in fifth grade and our teacher brought in a, te a teaching, a teacher's aide and her name was Miss Jacobson, and she had just returned from the BYU Jerusalem Center, and she was really excited about her experiences, and I remember that she taught us uh, different songs and showed us pictures, and she was just really thrilled about it, and I remember first having an in interest in the BYU Jerusalem Center because of her, and then later my parents, it was only like about nine months later, my parents went on a, a trip to, um, a three-week trip to Egypt, Italy, and Israel, and, and then later, my parents um, really wanted to make sure that I got to go there. And so they helped me after I was done with Ricks College to go to the BYU Jerusalem Center just weeks after I was done with school there. And so that was a, a neat experience for me and, and something I never expected. I never expected to be able to go to the BYU Jerusalem Center. So it was like a real dream and simply a dream, not like anything I expected would come true. But it ended up being a, a dream come true to go there. Now, while I was at BYU Jerusalem, there are some people that uh, I developed a really good friendship and relationships with that made the experience even better. And the, the two people that I wanted to mention are Cheryl and Joseph. And the three of us kind of felt like we were the three musketeers. I mean, we, we enjoyed uh, spending time together and, um, and the relationship was not only good while we were at uh, the center, but it continued after the center. Um, it, when we were done with the BYU Jerusalem experience, Cheryl wanted me to hold a place for, for her missionary who was serving his mission and wasn't going to be back to BYU um, for at least another semester. But he had a, um, an apartment picked out at Campus Plaza. And so Cheryl asked me if I would take his place and hold that so that uh, he would have a place to go to when he came back, which turned out to be a wonderful experience because that's where I met my first wife, Jamie. She was living at Campus Plaza, and, and uh, so that was neat to be able to have that. But then um, later, about 13 years later, uh, Jamie, my first wife, passed away. And the relationships that I had formed with Cheryl and Joseph uh, helped me during that uh, difficult time too. They both came to uh, the funeral, the memorial that we had, and, and they, it was really valuable for me to be with them during such a, a difficult time. So th those relationships that uh, form at the BYU Jerusalem Center can be uh, remarkable relationships. And the, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that Joseph just reached out to me last week because his father just passed away under similar circumstances as my wife. Um, both of them were on hospice at the end of their life. Both of us, Joseph and I, were caretakers for our spouse. Well, you know, he for his father and me for my wife. And we were both with them when they passed away. So um, uh, it's nice to be able to kind of return the, the, the support and friendship to Joseph during this trying time for him.
Uh, the next thing that I think is uh, worthwhile to, to talk about are some of the things that uh, surprised me when I went to Jerusalem. So when we were on our bus ride, leaving the airport, going to Jerusalem, we rounded a hill and I remember looking out and seeing a suburb of Jerusalem and I was shocked, I was surprised. The whole city was white. All the buildings were made of white limestone and it, I, I didn't expect that. Uh, it really looked special that way. And I later found out that there was um, a, a city ordinance that required all buildings to be made of white limestone, which I'm grateful for. It makes the holy land and that city appear holy in, in a way. So that was neat. Another neat experience um, that, that I had while at the Jerusalem Center were a couple service experiences. And um, one of the first nights that I was at the BYU Jerusalem Center, I was standing in line, we were getting ready for dinner, and next to me was um, the branch president and his wife. And he and I started talking, and I was just thrilled to talk to him about missionary work, and, and we had a great conversation. And I later found out that he says of all the people he'd met, he'd never met anyone more enthusiastic about missionary work. And so he extended a call to me as the branch president. And that call was to be the fellowshipping zone leader. You know, in, in Jerusalem, uh, in the Holy Land, uh, you know, we're, we can't proselyte. We can't do missionary work. It's against the rules. It's against the laws, as, as I understand it. Um, and so uh, being a fellowshipping zone leader, we would work just with the members. And part of our calling was every Sabbath, so every Saturday morning, we would go on the buses, drive north for a while, pick up people from Tel Aviv, members that, that uh, wanted to come worship at the center, and we'd bring them back to the center. And so that was an amazing experience. I went there with Cheryl. She and I would go there with a, a number of other people who were part of the fellowshipping zone. <clears throat> and what was neat is um, one of the uh, people that we would bring back was a person from the Philippines. I, I believe he was maybe a husband of maybe a member that was living in Tel Aviv. And uh, another student and I, his name was Danan, we got to teach this uh, Filipino person the gospel. We taught him the, the missionary discussions. And it was exciting because it's like, wow, we actually get to teach. And, and this was legal because the, it, the person wasn't a resident of Israel or Palestine. So, so it was okay for us to share the gospel that way. Uh, so that was a neat service experience. Um, another thing that surprised me was um, going down, like one of the, the next days, I, I went with a friend, Bradley, um, down from the center, going through the, down the hill to the Kidron Valley and, and walking in it. And what surprised me was it was considered a valley. You know, I grew up in Salt Lake Valley, went to school here in 
the Provo Valley. And I mean, a valley to me was a really wide open spot, you know, miles and miles long with, with you know, mountains. But this Kidron Valley was more like a, a little dry riverbed between two hills that came together. Um, so that was something kind of fun and surprising about my experiences at the BYU Jerusalem Center. Another neat service experience that we had is um, when I first arrived within about a week or two, I was talking with another female student and she, I think, had been talking with volunteers at the center um, who suggested that we arrange some volunteer work at a local hospital at Augusta Victoria Hospital. And so she told me about that and I loved the idea because I had done um, hospital volunteer work before I uh, left on my mission. Um, for about four years during high school. Every summer I would go do uh, hospital volunteer work. So anyway, I, I thought it was a great idea. I wanted to be a part of it. But then for whatever reason, she wasn't able to follow through with it and left me with arranging uh, the service opportunity. So I'm like, well, okay, I'll do my best. And we actually were able to work it out so that you know, all dozens and dozens of students uh, could go to Augusta Victoria Hospital on a, a weekly basis and help out in, in whatever they needed help with. And uh, one experience that I recall was going there and I, we actually went to the pediatric unit and there in the pediatric unit was a young Arabic girl who was in the dialysis unit and she was there with her father. And I, I and a, I think at least one or two other students came into that room and, and started talking with them we couldn't speak one another's languages. You know, they, they spoke Arabic, we spoke English, but the language of compassion, you know, we could speak that. And I just remember it being a touching experience to be able to be there with that father who I'm sure was going through a tough time with, you know, his young daughter having to be hooked up to these machines. And she was probably like five or six years old. So it's a really young daughter. Um, but that was a neat experience, a good service opportunity that, that we had um, at the BYU Jerusalem Center that I value a lot. And then um, some other neat experiences that I wanted to uh, share um, involved um, it, some remarkable teachers, some professors, and um, testimony actually that I that I got from others that in um, Jerusalem. So the the one professor that made a, a profound impact on me was Dr. Nizal, and he was our Islamic studies instructor. 
And Dr. Nizal, he actually worked with Elder Hunter at the time um, to establish the BYU Jerusalem Center. And I remember in one of the classes, he was describing his experiences establishing the center and making sure that everything was in place so that we could actually build the center and study there. And, um, and he described how he worked closely with President Hunter. And, and the, the neat thing for me was uh, at that time in my life, um, you know, I had grown up with President Ezra Taft Benson as my prophet together with um, President Gordon B. Hinckley and President Faust, that kind of that threesome. I really liked them. I, I felt a, a good connection to them as a kid growing up. Um, but then when President Hunter became the prophet, at the time he was very ill. And as a young, young person, I, I didn't have a real strong, um, I don't know, connection, I guess you could say, with President Hunter until Dr. Nazal told me about his experiences. And the neat thing was, is he says that he knew from his personal experiences with President Hunter that he was a prophet of God. This is our Muslim professor telling us that he knows his testimony was that he was a prophet of God. And not only that, but Dr. Nizal also proudly shared with us uh, that he was uh, termed a dry Mormon, that the president or elder Hunter called him a dry Mormon, which kind of meant, you know, kind of Mormon in heart, unbaptized. Uh, and so that, that was funny. And, and he, he shared that with us as students. He, he had a smile on his face. And so it was, it was, it was nice to see that. So that testimony from our Muslim professor was valuable to me. Then another testimony that was valuable to me came from a Hasidic Jew. So a very traditional Jewish person who's got the, the locks in his hair and, and nice hat. And uh, anyway, I met him at the Western Wall. So while I was at the Western Wall, I really wanted to hear from these really devout people what their feelings were and thoughts were as they studied the scripture. And for them, the Tanakh or the, you know, the, their Old Testament with the... Um, the books of Moses, the prophets. And, and anyway, I asked him about, I asked one of them while we were standing at a corner of the wall and then there was a little arch. And I, and I asked him, you know, how he felt as he studied it. And he told me his testimony. It's like, as I read it, as I study it, I feel that it's the words of God. You know, and that's something I could relate to too, because that's my testimony. And so it's neat to hear that from a person of another faith, a friend of another faith.
another experience, kind of the, the, the biggest or um, probably the uh, most memorable experience that I had at the BYU Jerusalem Center was another, um, I, I would say spiritual because of the divine protection that was involved. Um, but it happened on September 29th, which at the time was the Jewish New Year. Um, it was the, their first day of the new year for them, and General Ariel Sharon was trying to become the next prime minister of Israel. And so he, along with about a thousand soldiers, ended up marching onto the Temple Mount where the, the Muslims worship. Um, and on that day, earlier that day, um, before all this happened, we were told by amazing security and, and our administrators at the BYU Jerusalem Center where we could go, when we could go in the city like they normally did. They would give us these security details. But anyway, they told us where we could go and, and when we needed to come back. And on this particular day, they said, okay, between noontime and two o'clock, you can go and, and some of you can exchange money for everybody at al because that's where we would normally go to exchange your money. And we, we love that place. And it was just down down the hill from the center into the Kidron Valley, up the hill, and then we'd walk on some roads that would take us parallel to the old um, the old city that's walled, and and then we would walk a few blocks and then take a ride up the road to go to Aladdin's. But anyway, on this day we left at about one o'clock. We we're one of the last little groups, and when I say we, it was Cheryl and uh, another young woman, and then there was another threesome that we ended up. Um, combining together with as we came back but so we, we went there we started walking about one o'clock we knew we needed to be back by two um, when we got to Aladdin's, the lines were a little longer than we expected and we needed to change our money and other students money to dinars because we were planning on going to Jordan um, that was just kind of part of our schedule to go from the Holy Land area and then into Jordan and, and to see sites there and that was going to be I believe on Sunday and this day was a Friday um, but as we finally got our money exchanged for the, the Jordanian dinars, um, I, we started leaving out of the, of Aladdin's money exchange. And I immediately met with some people on the road, just locals that cared about us. And one of the locals said, Hey, uh, get back to your school. It's dangerous right now. What, um, you, you need to get back, you know, hurry. And so we, we took note of that and like, okay. And so we started coming down the hill back to where in front of us was Damascus Gate, one of the, the entrances and exits of uh, the, the Temple Mount, where the, the Dome of the Rock is, the, the Muslim revered spot. Well, apparently that's where Ariel Sharon was. And um, because of his march, it, it upset some people who were worshiping at the time uh, on the Mount and near the Alaska Mosque. Um, and I guess it's my understanding that people started throwing rocks and the Israeli soldiers who were there, they started firing rubber bullets. And then um, the Palestinians, the, the, the Muslims who were there, responded to the rubber bullets by firing, there were snipers in the area that started firing real bullets. And then it just, from there, escalated into what became the Second Intifada. So we were actually a part of history. We were there when the Second Intifada began. Uh, but at the time, we didn't know what was happening. We just saw a lot of people streaming out of Damascus Gate. We saw uh, you know, people being carried by others, and we're like, whoa, something's definitely wrong. And so we, we were doing our best to make it through the, the streets, running parallel to the walls. And as we were doing that, everything started to just close in. There were people that just started getting packed in. We saw ambulances starting to run back and forth, and it felt like a war zone. It was, I'd never been in a war zone before, but just the, the kind of the pressure of it all felt scary and dangerous. I mean, we heard riots breaking out. Um, there was apparently, a, you know, a, a lot of uh, some explosions going on, but Anyway, uh, I was trying to be oblivious to it because I'm like, okay, we got to get back to the center. So I'm going to focus on getting us back. And one of the young ladies who was with us, she was having a really difficult time. And so I was trying to direct her along the way. Ultimately, we got to um, an intersection between, I think it's Sultan Solomon Street and Route 417. It's, it's a big intersection at the corner of the, the Temple Mount area. And there, the, the traffic was crazy, speeding uh, uh, at dangerous speeds, and, and a lot of riots still breaking out around us, and barricades starting to be put up so that we can't, couldn't get back to the center. Um, but 
it, uh, while we were there, we, we kind of were, were able to get out to an island area near in the intersection. And Cheryl, she distinctly heard someone shout in a firm, stern voice, go now. And that happened to be a point where there was a break in the, the uh, the traffic and the people so that we could safely get across the street. And so Cheryl was like, okay. And she was, she was at the back waiting for all of us to go because of the, the voice that told us to go now. None of us did. And, and so she shouts, go now. And so we all did. We followed her direction. We, we went across the street safely. And then she reports, at least to me, she said that um, she looked back at, to see who had been kind enough to warn us to go. And she saw no one. No one was there. And so it's her distinct belief, and I believe too, that yeah, we had some uh, some help from above, some divine assistance there, um, trying to get us through a, a dangerous spot and to protect us, which I believe the, the Lord does for us uh, as we rely on him and as we go about trying to, to do the right thing. Um, so so we, we finally went down the Kidron Valley and back up, and again, the ambulances are still screaming past us. It's It's still a very scary experience and then um it took us about 10 minutes to get across the one road that's just right by the jerusalem center and we were we thought we were the last group but i've, I've since found out that there were three other young ladies that got stuck in the the city that actually came back after us um, because their original taxi driver refused to drive them back and they had to get, get another ride back because because of the the violence that was breaking out and then as a result of that whole experience uh, we were on lockdown to keep all of us safe the administrators changed our schedule so that we went to Jordan, I think, a day earlier. Um, so we were out of the, the area that was just turning and becoming very violent. And, and in fact, it was something that was violent for the next six years, which is why we were the last group um, in, at the BYU Jerusalem Center until winter of 2007. So about seven years that students couldn't be there. And we actually had to leave um, a month early. But the neat thing was, is those the administrators at BYU, just they did amazing work where they made sure that we could still have uh, a, a very healthy and vibrant experience in the Holy Land and at the BYU Jerusalem Center. So they were able to, to rearrange when we went to Mount Sinai. They got to rearrange all these other trips that we were going to do so that we could do them in a shorter amount of time so that when we left a month early, we didn't feel like we missed anything. I mean, it was, a, again, a wonderful experience that I'm grateful that I got to do. And, um, yeah, definitely one that I won't forget. And Another neat experience of, of things that, that put me in awe while I was at the, the center was first going to the Dead Sea um, and going to Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And I loved that experience. I was really looking forward to going to the, the, the actual site 
where the the ancient records were discovered and and I got a picture of myself next to cave four where which is the library the library where um, you know the, the majority of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found so that was neat Another experience that kind of put me in awe was just Galilee in general. Um, for me, Galilee was neat because when I went there, I felt a distinct presence of the Lord. I mean, the, it felt like the Lord was there in, in Galilee for me. And um, I hadn't felt that before on um, the experience, the, the, a real presence of the Lord. But, but there it, it, I did. I felt like his, I don't know, his, his influence radiated from the area. And, And, and a particular experience that was neat for me was going to Nazareth. Uh, when we went to Nazareth, there was a church that had um, a statue of the Holy Family with young little Jesus and uh, his uh, stepfather Joseph and Mary. And uh, when I saw that in the side of this church, I was just deeply impressed. I, I genuinely felt the warmth and sweetness of the Spirit touch me as I looked at that family um, and that's that was something that was really neat that that surprised me and, and and put me in awe so more than just surprise more like reverent awe and um, that that was definitely one of the most profound spiritual experiences um, that I've had and um, one that that sticks with you um, through the years
overall going to the area where uh, Christ lived, he taught, where he died, he suffered for us, was something that I personally wanted to do, and I'm grateful that I had that experience because it helped help me see um, and put into a little more of uh, reality what happened, more than just kind of mentally imagine th these things, but to actually see it. That was very valuable for me. And I'm grateful also for the experiences of other faiths that are there, the, the different, uh, the, uh, the Jewish faith, the Muslim faith, the other Christians who are there who have worked hard to try to memorialize spiritually significant places and events um, so that we can uh, go and return and see them. And at the time when I, I saw, say, for example, the Garden of Gethsemane, um, it, it, it was enclosed by a church and at the time I didn't like it so much but now I'm, I'm very grateful that there's a church that that um, has kind of made that experience a real one where we can go and see that and that it hasn't been uh, ruined by time and so the the experience of going to BYU Jerusalem the experience of learning there the experience of being with uh, professors and other students and administrators who all have uh, you know, great uh, experiences to draw on and, and good relationships to build with is, is magnificent.